Hello, I'm Katie Jarvis, and this week, Real Foot Forward is made possible by our friends at William Sausage, the home of authentic country goodness and family-owned and operated since 1958, right here in Tennessee. Welcome to Real Foot Forward from Discovery Park of America, located up here in the corner of beautiful West Tennessee. Every day at our museum and heritage park, we inspire children and adults to see beyond. And each week, we do the same thing here on our podcast. In today's episode, Scott sits down with Kathy Dumont, who helped revitalize downtown Linden, Tennessee. And later on, we talk about the discoveries we've made here at Discovery Park of America. Hello, I'm Scott Williams, host of Real Foot Forward, where each week we celebrate our little section of the South. And just like our museum and heritage park here in Union City, we explore the culture, the spirit, the accomplishments, and the heritage of West Tennessee. When you sit down in a dining room of the Commodore Cafe in Linden, Tennessee, you'll see a quote painted on the wall. And in the end, it's not the years in your life that count, it's the life in your years. Well, today's guest is certainly filling her years with lots of life as she and her husband seem to be taking over an entire town. We have the owner of the Commodore Cafe here, Kathy Dumont. Welcome, Kathy. Thank you, Scott. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Kathy is basically all the HGTV stars rolled into one person. Um, if HGTV is listening, this is your next That's show. That's so funny. Yes. I, right? thi- I think you, from from the stuff you're doing with your dogs, mm. to the farm, to the um, <laughs> to the cafe, to the, you know refurbishing the town right? and the festival, yeah, that's I would true. watch a show about you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you. So, Linden, Tennessee is a completely different place than it was when you very first stepped into the town. Can you yes. tell me what, where were you and how did you end up in Linden? Sure, sure. And I'd like to say not taking over the town, you know, sure. when, when you mentioned that. Sure. I like to think of it as we're inspiring the whole You're town. You're inspiring change. Yes. yes. Yeah, well, and, and just more business and more improvement. Not that it really needed a lot of improving, because that's why we fell in love with the place. It was a beautiful, um, out of the way town, peace and quiet. That's that's what we were looking for. And where we, were you at the time we, when you were looking for it? We lived in Rhode Island, and we had a second home in Florida. Actually, uh, Michael and I, my husband Michael and I, um, were doing very well in real estate and uh, mortgages. And I worked for a small bank. But in, two very different places than Tennessee. Yes, yes. And we would go to Florida as a getaway. And after a while, it just wasn't a getaway anymore. There's no peace and quiet, everything, lots of traffic everywhere. I mean, nothing quiet about it at all or relaxing. And um, so we started looking for land all over the country, actually. And all these pictures were drawing us to Tennessee, the pictures of land, wide open space, creeks, um pictures of caves and all these pictures of old dilapidated homes actually that were falling down but maybe part of it was a log cabin just I, we could see all the history there plus all the natural beauty we were just completely drawn to that and came down here never been here didn't know anybody who lived in Tennessee wow That's and amazing. just came down and my husband came down first and he called me I was in a meeting and left me a message saying, I'm in paradise. This is beautiful down here. I can't wait for you to come down here and see it. And, wow. And we came down the next uh, weekend and fell in love with the place and and bought it, like, immediately. And it was, was it in Linden or on the outskirts? It's Well, just on the outskirts of Linden. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And describe but, it for us. Um. Well... There's a creek, you you um, pull off the highway, state highway, and then you cross over a creek. You had to drive through an actual creek, maybe six inches of water, 10 feet wide. And then you'd come up to this open field, maybe 20 acres or so that wide open, and then all hills and um, hollows and everything, uh, lots of trees, 
um, creeks, other creeks, you know, branches going into that main creek. Was and, there a house mm-hmm, already standing? An old, old farmhouse falling down, trees growing through the porches and everything. Um, but just it, there was something magical about it. I mean, we had seen a few other places going to on route to this place, and as soon as we got there, I can't ex- describe the feeling that came over me. Like this is it. This wow. this is the place. I feel like this is home for some reason. Yeah. So it was really really strange. It's crazy how that happens, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I I was blown away by that. And so you, did, I'm assuming, did you move right in the house, or did you move close <laughs> by and re- remodel the house? Right. We had to commute. Um, not only were we commuting from Rhode Island because you know this was just a second home, a getaway place, but um, we would stay at a local bed and breakfast or at a hotel that was like 25 miles away. That was really the closest hotel. And you were not in the hospitality Mm-mm. business at all. So right. you, you, so you in guys banking. were, yeah, you, you were, this was, you know, but you were possibly being, uh, seeds were being planted. Uh, that's right. That's right. Because we were, that was one of our um, thoughts that, oh, I can't believe we have to go 25 Five miles to find a hotel or a good place to stay and this inn of course was just down the road and that was very nice but anyway we it had, had only a few rooms so that was sort of limiting and so then at some point you decided uh, we've had enough it, yeah. it's time to move here and become farmers right right <laughs> <laughs> Sort of like that, yeah. We came down for a long Christmas break, and I was we were here for about two weeks. And at the end of it, we were um, sitting having pancakes at this local diner, and I just started crying into my pancakes. And I said, "I don't want to go home. I don't want to go back. This is so great here. You know, I'm so relaxed and just oh, you know, at peace with everything. And the people are so friendly, and I just didn't want to go." Uh, back to Rhode Island, and Michael said, "Well, quit your job then." And I thought, "Okay, I, I'll do that." And and so that sort of started into the farming and getting into being on the land more. But then Michael came down about a year later is when we, everything sort of came together. And now, and so you guys actually—is it actually a working farm? Mm, we like to say it's a hobby farm. Mm-hmm. So there's what there's you, definitely a raise? lot of work. Um, we raise sheep and um, they're baby doll Southdown sheep, so they're miniature. And then I also have Australian Shepherd dogs. And then we've rescued some horses along the way. And um, of course, See, you're, a few you're, cats writing, and you're writing a movie right now. Right? I mean, that's like the perfect, <laughs> that's like the perfect life. Oh, uh, that's amazing. Well, yeah, we want people to come and see it and experience it with us. And, and feel that amazing joy and, you know, peacefulness of, of what we've experienced. Right, you, know? well, we, you had me at uh, Miniature Sheep. I mean, <laughs> right. That's, that's fascinating. <laughs> They're so cute. Yeah. <laughs> so at some point, you guys, um, you decided to get into the hospitality business. Right. Well, it, sort of backdoor into hospitality, I guess. The um, This building came up for sale. Michael... Unbeknownst to me, Michael had been sort of keeping an eye on this building in downtown Linden, which was just super quiet. Like the buildings were run down, lots of big power lines. Um, The sidewalks were all cracked and and sort of in odd shapes and everything. I read where 14 of the storefronts were empty. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm hmm. Exactly. Exactly. So really sleepy town. The only things open were a couple hair salons. Which your husband has, he must be visionary because the last thing I would think about then would be, hey, I think I'm going to buy one of those. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right, right. And that's something I've always admired about him. And and I guess I'm, I, you could say that about me too, because um, I just have a lot of faith and a lot of uh, hope and positive thinking and everything. Uh, but he bought it, you know, as soon as the for sale sign came in the window, he bought it and because he wanted to save the building because he saw what a significant building it was to the downtown being right in the center of downtown across the street from the courthouse and everything. And it was in, um, in disrepair, you know, bad disrepair. The, there were holes in the roof and everything else. So things are really starting to go And did you walk south. in and like look around and say, oh, wow, <laughs> we have a lot ahead of us, a lot of hard yeah, work. Yeah, yeah, but then, you know, there were 
some silver linings, but but that's the thing. I guess I just saw the the bones of it, and I have his same vision where I can see what it's meant to be. And what what did you guys when when you first saw it, and what what were you planning to turn it into, and did it become that, or did it change yeah. through the process? Um, it. It basically it stayed um, true to what we envisioned. And, of course, we're still working on that vision all the time, tweaking it a little bit here and there. But we envisioned having, you know, a hotel that would have, we thought maybe we'd just open the doors and turn on the sign and people would start flooding in and, and uh, we'd be busy. Well, it didn't happen that way. Of course, we opened and right then is when the economy tanked. Mm-hmm. And... Um, so we were struggling, and, and that's when we started networking and getting creative with um, how to draw people to the area, and we really got involved in tourism as a whole and understanding you know, the flow of people in and out of this area and, and what draws people to the area and how so to for, draw people So for listeners who don't know, can you tell us roughly where Linden, Tennessee is in comparison to, say, Nashville or Jackson? or Right. It's sort of halfway between Nashville and Jackson and then south. Um, so we're about an hour um, east of Jackson and south, and right on 412, actually. Um, 412 goes right through Jackson. And... Uh, which is also old Route 100 in, in our section in Linden, it is, um, and it's right on the Tennessee River too. The town itself isn't on the Tennessee River, but the county is on the river. And it, you're only about an hour and a half from Union City, I noticed. So I told my wife, "This is where we're going to go the next." Time. Oh we're yeah, go good, somewhere. good, yeah. yes, yeah. yes. So tell us. Do. I mean, the place looks amazing because you have live Thank music. You. I love, I love a lot of the things you're doing on social media. You know the mm-hmm. way you're you're branding. You know the place. Tell us a right, little bit about right. it. Yes. Uh, well, we have live music. We've realized that music is such an integral part of this area, and we, and so um, we have live music from local musicians and also drawing from Nashville, Jackson area to to um, Linden. And we, let's see, we, we try to bring people out um, to spend a weekend as a getaway from the city, from Nashville or Jackson or Memphis, uh, to spend some time in peace and quiet, just like we did when we first started going there. And uh, so we we do the live music, we um, offer tours of the farm, we try to get people out on the river. There's the Buffalo River also, which has uh, which is a smaller river, and people do a lot of canoeing and kayaking and floating on that river. Um, so a lot of outdoor activities that, that people do there. And not- Ag tourism is like on is growing a lot because of folks like you who are who are doing that, and it's mm-hmm. really uh, becoming more and more popular. Right, right. And we try to be that bridge in between. Try to get people um, to the farms themselves. There are a lot of Mennonite farmers in our area, so of course they aren't online and everything like right. like we are. So we try to get people to to those places because those are really interesting to see oh, yeah. yeah no they're incredible mm-hmm. so um the work that you all did on the commodore um was an impetus to change for the whole community um, right i think if you go there now today it's a whole different town than Completely. it was yes. when you guys first pulled up um what what um what else has been going on in the town thanks to the change here well We really, it it seemed like everything sort of happened all at once. It was like a mini renaissance that that occurred. When we started redoing the hotel, then other people started buying other storefronts and redoing them. And um, we even encouraged a few people who we knew could um, handle, you know, buying some other storefronts to rent out and everything. Um... It, which they did, and it just really changed the whole environment. And um, then they also got a grant to redo the sidewalks and everything, um, bury the power lines, move them, that sort of thing. And so that completely changed the street itself. The sidewalks were redone, all of the um, street lamps, and they put it up benches. And I mean, it's just a beautiful uh, city now. 
That's you know? incredible. And there are restaurants. I was mm-hmm. looking online, and um, art is a big part. Right. Uh, art is a big part of the town's culture now. Right, right. Something like 40 artists right now in Linden, yeah, That's selling crazy, their wares. Right. That's yes. amazing. Yes. Um, and so, <sighs> so obviously it gives you a sense of pride when you can look at the place that you've built and, and the town. Um, and I'm sure everyone's applauding, but are there, you know, when you do business in a rural uh, environment you're you're working with sometimes with people who have were born their parents were born there this is their home they're a little bit more resistant to change have you found any right kind of right pushback? we yeah we've we've had people that um w- are weren't big fans of all the change like especially the streetscape they thought we were responsible for that um which we weren't i mean the we there were state architects that came in and you know had to um, make a certain design according to the state's uh, guidelines. But um, really, I, I got to say, like, everyone was so uh, welcoming to us and there wasn't the pushback that you would think. And right. maybe because we came out of a place of respect and, you know, we we loved the place. We didn't really want to change. We weren't coming in there to change it. Right. We just saw the building. We wanted to, you know, get some business there. We wanted to bring people so they could enjoy what we loved about the place and, um, you know, make some cosmetic improvements. And and really people were welcoming and they've really embraced us, which which is just wonderful and, and so unique, I think, for small towns. Yeah. A lot of towns, you don't find that. And the town leaders are amazing and have always been great to well, work with. With, with um, renewed um, economics mm-hmm. come visitors, mm-hmm. and with visitors come money to spend. <laughs> right. And so the visitors are spending money, yes. which helps the city yes. be able to pave the roads and bury the lines and mm-hmm. plant the trees. And so it's really exactly. a cycle that has to get started, and you guys started it. So um, I think it's really important um, that everybody in small towns understand, you know, how important it is to get visitors. Yes, 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 exactly. And luckily, our mayor at the time was a visionary, and he saw that, and we became quick friends, and we helped each other with all of that. And just he was a make it happen type of guy, and so are we. We're make it happen type of people, and yeah. uh, you don't just talk about it; you just do whatever you need to do to make it happen. And um, then his, uh, uh, Wes Ward, who is now the mayor, is is continuing that now. What do you think is the most important thing for people who are in towns now that may be rural communities that have the potential for a big tourism business? What, what kind of advice would you give them on how they need to approach the business of tourism? Um, what I've, found people who understand how much money it brings and jobs and things like that, uh, they're on board. It, it seems that people who don't understand the numbers and it seems like those are the places that have more of an issue. And um, so I guess if you have a budding tourism business, I would say get in touch with the Tennessee Department of Tourism and they can give you the numbers like the savings per household annually, what um, tax dollars people are saving because of all the tourism money coming into their county. So that is huge. And that, you know, there's no way that a a county commissioner, a mayor, whomever it may be in their community that may be preventing them or putting up a roadblock or something, you know, once you show them those types of figures, I think it's just a no brainer. Um, a lot of uh, small towns or a lot of people looking to get more tourism dollars also do um, festivals or, you know, uh, some kind of like whether it's the Shrimp Festival or the Magnolia Festival. or And so Linden has a festival. Um, right. Why don't you tell us about that? Right. The Blooming Arts Festival. We just had our 11th annual um, festival wow. day many, this weekend. How many weekend. people come? There were 172 vendors. Wow. 
Right. And then just thousands of people um, there uh, and people sold out of things. I mean, some of the vendors sold out of things. It, it was really amazing. It's all fine art, like sculpture and painting. It's, it's and fine. Art. It's a mixture. It's fine art. And then it's some some things that are more accessible, like uh, people making handmade jewelry and and things that are... Um, soap and candles. Yeah, and, yeah, you know, right. Soap yeah. and candles, right? Yeah. Especially with the farm, you know, ag tourism right. and everything. Right. Yep. Did yeah. you take any miniature um, sheep? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, not yet. Not yet. And so um, you guys uh, didn't stop with the Commodore. You have some other uh, buildings that you have remodeled or are mm-hmm. in the process of. What are the other projects that you have? Right. Going on? We have um, a building. A couple doors down, that is called. We've called it Miss Birdie's Boarding House, um, which is basically an extension of the hotel. But there was a woman, Birdie Averett, who owned that building in the 30s, and she was quite a businesswoman, which we are celebrating. We love the, the fact that she was a woman and very successful in business and and um, uh, really a go-getter. And so she had rooms to rent on the upstairs over her retail space. So we redid that into all hotel rooms. We have uh, eight hotel rooms there. And then we have um, an old grocery store, which we're rehabbing into a, a living space. We also bought the original bank building in town, which was turn of the century, 1904, was when that was built. And um, so we have some offices there, an apartment, and um, the local radio station works out of that. Um, and then most recently, we bought... Um, something in the next town, Clifton, it, which, you know, we thought we were going to come to blows, uh, Michael and I thought. <laughs> <laughs> we really had some struggles with that, but um, <laughs> challenges, I should say. Uh, but that um, was a Victorian home that we've spent now three and a half years oh, wow. redoing. And yeah. is it going to be like a bed and breakfast? Yes. Mm-hmm. I it mean, it sounds to me breakfast. like you left all that work up north. You I came know, down I here. Know. It sounds like you have even more work. I know. <laughs> I'm I know. exhausted it, it, Right, <laughs> right. I know. It, it seems like it, but it's still, you know, every day I'm thinking this is paradise. It really is beautiful. I mean, just driving here today, seeing all the redbud trees and everything, we don't have anything like that. We're, back where we came from. And, and again, the people are just so friendly. And that's what we hear all the time from um, hotel guests and people who just stop for a bite to eat or something, Europeans, you know, every, everybody all over the world who comes, they always just talk about how friendly the people are and how amazing uh, they are. And, yeah, and that's, so, what we, that's what we're finding, uh, you know, moving from Washington is just, just the, as I was telling you earlier, just the... the perceptions that you have of the South on TV, you mm, know, re- really, right. really is true. The people really are, you know, they make you feel like you're part of the hometown just almost immediately. Yes. So, yes. You know, right. It's incredible. Right, they do. Yeah. So, so what's next? For you? <laughs> um, well, we're still getting the B and B off the ground and, um, What's next probably is we have to go back and rehab the hotel again because it's been 10 years. Wow. Yeah, Are yeah. Are you going to have like a big 10-year celebration? Uh, like we we big, did. Yeah, oh, you did it, that was last year. I guess okay. it's 11 years okay. now, but yeah. I missed the we big did. party. Right, I missed right. the the fine arts festival. I'm going to have to do that <laughs> next year. Right. But I am going to go ahead and come. And your food. We should talk about your food and your restaurant. Mm. Who's your chef? It looks incredible Oh, online. well, thank you. Thank you. We... I get inspired. Actually, I'm sort of the executive chef. I it feels See, odd using that's an, that term. That's another reality show person <laughs> right, that you exactly. could be also for HGTV. <laughs> right, right. Um, but uh, we just try to come up with great ideas, watch the trends out there in food and restaurants, and also stay true to Southern cooking and everything and things that people want to uh, have when they're traveling in this part of the world. And and we have a fun time with it. We're we're always looking on Pinterest. Actually, we mine Pinterest all the time for great ideas and things. Well, new you, dishes. you do a great job. It looks incredible. Well, the thank food, you. the the hotel, the music, everything. I mean, it's it's at the top of my list of oh, things well, to good. do. Thank so you. I'm that makes us feel so great. Where can anybody who wants to come stay with you? Where can they find out more details? On our website, which is Commodore Hotel Linden. Uh, dot com um, and 
we also have one for the inn, Commodore Inn, Clifton, Commodore Inn at Clifton.com. Okay. And um, we're also on Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter, so YouTube. You, you've got it all covered. You're, yeah, you're, yeah. Uh, you've learned about tourism marketing. <laughs> you're right, you're making right. it happen. Thank you for being here today. Oh, thank you. This and was fun. you'll have to come back. Um, you know, in September, actually, we're having our bicentennial celebration. So oh. that's going to be another little mini arts festival and okay. um, celebrating the history. We'll do that. I bet you're already, yeah. I bet you're already sold out. Your, oh, your, we're getting um, there. Uh, we're yep. getting there. I'll have to do it quick. <laughs> um, thank you very much. From the Blooming Art Festival to someone who blooms where she's planted, let's see what Katie Jarvis has discovered for us today at Discovery Park of America. Thank you, Scott. I'm Katie Jarvis here at Discovery Park of America, and on today's episode, we have Amanda Mayo here with us. And Amanda, we have a lot of mothers that come and visit Discovery Park of America, and today you're going to tell us a little bit about an artifact that relates to a misunderstood mother. So what's that about? So here at the Discovery Park, we have a dinosaur egg nest, and a lot of kids ask me questions about that. And I love telling them the story of the oviraptor, who is the misunderstood mother of the fossil record. In 1924, a geology expedition to Mongolia discovered a new dinosaur species. There was a lot of exploration going around in the 20th century and in the early 1900s, and they were just trying to explore the earth we live on because there wasn't a lot of um, charted territory then still. And they discovered this new fossil and they found it it was kind of like laid next to a nest of dinosaur eggs so knowing everything the scientists in 1924 decided that that dinosaur was trying to steal the eggs from the nest when it was still alive so they named it the oviraptor Um, that's latin ova means egg and raptor means thief so they named an entire species based on one fossil so Um, They thought that it was trying to steal the eggs, and that's what we thought for many, many years until the 1990s. In the 1990s, another expedition went, and they discovered another fossil just like the one they had found before. And again, the body was thrown out right above the dinosaur eggs, like right on top of it. And in the 1990s, you know, scientists learned a little bit more about the scientific method and the process that we need to go to before we can just kind of blurt something out about a new species. So they did some research and they compared it to the other eggs and they realized that it was on the same type of eggs that the the people in 1924 had misidentified as a protoceratops. So they identified the eggs and they said, wait, this dinosaur was trying to guard this nest of eggs. So the oviraptor that they had found and they had named it the egg thief was actually a mother dinosaur who was sitting on top of her nest of eggs trying to guard them from, I guess, whatever was happening geologically at that point, whether it was a flood or a sandstorm or something like that, that eventually covered both the mother and the nest. She never left her egg, her eggs. So they I always ask kids, I said, do you think that we should rename the entire dinosaur species because it's so misunderstood? And all the kids will nod their heads, yes, yes, we should. So I often take a vote. And we know more about the oviraptor now than ever before. We know that it's a brooding dinosaur. And a brooder is an animal, specifically like a bird or something, that will sit on her nest of eggs. And, you know, they'll often kind of turn them and keep them evenly heated and stuff like that. Um, And we also know that that is the most bird-like dinosaur in the fossil record. They had a beak with no teeth. We don't exactly know what they ate because, again, we weren't there to observe them in their natural habitat because they're now extinct since humans have been alive. And they also, we think that they had feathers. So they are, again, one of those dinosaurs that we think had feathers instead of those reptile scales that we see in all the movies. Speaking of movies, I know the term oviraptor, it sounds familiar to me. So where have I heard that term before. So if you've read any of the Jurassic Park novels, um, one of the potential fossils that they mentioned being able to find at the Snakewater dig site was a dinosaur called the Oviraptor. So it wasn't in the movies, but it was mentioned in the books. And I say younger audiences, but then I said, wait, maybe my age audiences might um, have seen the Land Before Time movie and TV series. There was a character named Ruby who was an Oviraptor, and she again was depicted, uh, she didn't have any feathers really. She kind of had some plumage on on her back, but um, Ruby, Ruby is an oviraptor. 
Um, Amanda, just talking with you for these past few minutes, I can tell that you have a passion for dinosaurs and for geology and paleontology. Tell us a little bit how you got into that. So in seventh grade, I applied for a volunteer position at the Fernbank Museum of Natural History in Atlanta, Georgia. I got that position as a fun volunteer. So it was called Fernbank Ultimate Naturalist. and It was a teen volunteer position. And I did that seventh grade through high school. And I realized that I really loved natural history. I was one of those kids that I never grew out of the dinosaur phase. Here I am in college still talking about dinosaurs like I was when I was three years old. Um, so I really love talking about that. And I love educating other students about it. Very good. And speaking of that, you are also part of the Miss Tennessee Volunteer Pageant. So tell us a little bit about that and your platform. Yes, ma'am. I am Miss University of Tennessee at Martin, and I'm competing in the Miss Tennessee Volunteer Pageant this June. Um, I love to talk about earth science. So I said, well, how can I work with that when I go visit schools as Miss UT Martin? My platform or something that we advocate for when we compete in the pageant is called Stand for STEM, promoting earth science in the classroom. And what I do a lot is trying to get kids and other adults all the time excited about earth science and everything our world has to offer. So that's anywhere from the beautiful minerals that we have on the mineral wall in the Natural History Gallery to the dinosaur egg nest that you can find by our pterosaurs and our Edmontosaurus here in the dinosaur hall. So I try to educate, I try to just get kids excited and they want to learn about the earth and natural history. Well, thank you so much, Amanda. And um, thank you for being on the podcast today. And if you want to learn more about Natural History Gallery and all the different things that we have here at Discovery Park of America, we hope that you will come see us real soon. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. If you enjoyed this podcast, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review on iTunes or wherever you may be listening. Plan your own adventure to see beyond at Discovery Park of America by visit discoveryparkofamerica.com. Be sure to also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.